it has been really a, 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 a privilege and a pleasure to uh, be in the, the semi-regular uh, cycle of teachers for um, this Friday morning, usually, usually Friday morning, um, I, I, I taught, I think Chris, uh, what we, some might, might call Christmas Eve was on a Thursday. Um, so as Julie just said, this, this Torah portion, uh, the Torah portion that we will read in uh, synagogues, if you're in a synagogue tomorrow or perhaps over Zoom, as, as I will be with my uh, soon-to-be congregation in Pittsburgh, but attending virtually from Brooklyn, um, is out of the, the standard cycle. And that's an important note, I'm glad that, that Julie added, because um, this is actually not the only time that we will read this snippet of uh, what, what otherwise appears as Parashat Kitisa. Um, uh, it is what we will read tomorrow is also read on Kol Hamoed Shabbat of Sukkot, um, the, the Shabbat that, that falls whenever it falls on, on Sukkot. And, and there's a, an algorithm of sorts for determining um, how the holidays fall out when uh, these, these readings, holiday readings for Shabbat uh, take place. And the, the, the passage that we will focus on this morning um, is, uh, is key not just to why we read it on uh, this portion on Pesach and Sukkot, but then also it's, um, much of it is read on fast days and uh, very famously uh, appears in our Slichot prayers before Rosh Hashanah and then on Yom Kippur. And I am, of course, referring to the 13 attributes of mercy, what are called uh, in Hebrew, the Yud Gemil Midot Shel Chesed. Um, what are these? Um, and, um, and most importantly, how can we begin to do some detective work about how uh, this passage became so famous? Why is it that liturgically it is used so much, liturgically as a Torah portion to be read in synagogue, uh, liturgically to be recited by congregations. And on fast days, you might have experienced this in call and response between the Torah reader and those in attendance. Um, the, the Torah reader will pause and the kahal, the congregation, will recite these verses uh, before then the Torah reader resumes the chanting and, and says them uh, him or herself. Uh, there are some key differences, however, uh, the way that um, the passage appears and the way that that call and response uh, works in our tradition leaves out some details. And uh, so that's where we're headed this morning. Um, with the end in mind, why is it? Uh, what, what can we tell about how the rabbis understood this, this passage? What were they wrestling with? And then in their wrestling, how did they give rise to these liturgical practices in order to emphasize God's attributes of mercy and compassion as ones that we not only seek in our relationship with God, however we understand God, but also, of course, in trying to emulate the divine, how do we impress upon ourselves the absolute central importance of living a life um, filled with, with mercy, loving kindness, and compassion ourselves towards ourself, our individual self, those around us, and, um, and as a worldview in general. With that in mind, let's turn to the text. Um, going to share my screen if you want to. Um, um, instead, have this on download. Uh, okay, hold on. That was that was my preparing with the, the the end in mind just before we got started. So I've retyped. I've titled this a little bit differently than you might see it um, in your. Um, on your screen, the file appears somewhat differently, but Pesach, Teshuvah, and Grouth Mindset. I'll explain that last uh, phrase is important in terms of uh, education, not just Jewish education these days. Growth Mindset, in brief, uh, is a school of thought that uh, we all, as lifelong learners, uh, don't just simply easily learn new things. Challenges are good. Uh, as a uh, long distance runner myself, uh, one who is quite out of practice right now, it will be um, a little bit painful uh, right after this, this class when I get on a bike to ride to get my second vaccine shot at a hospital here in Brooklyn uh, because my legs are out of practice from, from um, 
uh, from normal exercise, what I'm used to as a runner, uh, that's not a problem. I am not actually um, hurting myself. That's my body telling myself, oh, I need to be practicing this more. And those challenges are good. That, that sense of uh, not pain but ache is if we can translate that into an, a psychological sense or an educational sense, that's how we know where we have room to grow, um, where we, we need to be uh, moving um, in, uh, in uh, developmental psychological terms that's called the zone of proximal development. Where, are, where do our next steps need to be? So we'll come back to that with the, the last part of Talmud that we will be learning this morning, but I want us to begin with that, that idea that um, God and Moses are in a relationship that is still quite nascent here in Exodus 34. So I'll, uh, I've begun this passage, citing this passage before the main verses of our attention. Verse 34, four begins, so Moses carved two tablets of stone like the first, and early in the morning, he went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, as God had commanded him, taking the two stone tablets with him. By the way, as I'm using uh, certain God language here, uh, bear in mind, uh, once again, I am indebted to the website uh, and app Safaria. I am using entirely their translations. I don't recall exactly which translation. I believe it's the New Jewish Publication Society translation here. Um, there are a number of other translations that have come out more recently, but um, I highly recommend the website and the app for your uh, individual use beyond this. So uh, their, their translation continues, verse five. The Lord came down in a cloud. He stood with him there and proclaimed the name Lord. And now here, here begins that, this, the, the famous lines of the, the 13 attributes. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in kindness and faithfulness. Verse seven, extending kindness to the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he does not remit all punishment, but visits the iniquity of parents upon children and children's children upon the third and fourth generations. Uh, and that's the end of God speaking here. Verse eight, Moses hastened to bow low to the ground in homage. Verse nine, and said, if I have gained your favor, O Lord, pray, let the Lord go in our midst, even though this is a stiff necked people. Pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your own. Um, pause before that, la the last verse here. What's the, what's the iniquity and sin? This is of course following the, uh, if there is original sin in Judaism, in rabbinic Judaism really, um, it is not anything tied to the Garden of Eden. It is the sin of the golden calf. It is after God delivers the, the, the Israelite people out of slavery in Egypt, after God begins to deliver through Moses the Ten Commandments and the, the rest of Revelation, that they turn away and with Aaron make a golden calf to worship. They, they break the, one of the, 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 really the first and second commandments right there, um, having other gods before um, our own God, the, the, the source of all life. So Moses said, I hereby make a covenant before all your, sorry, God says, I hereby make a covenant before all your people. I will work such wonders as have not been wrought on all the earth or in any nation and all the people who are with you shall see how awesome are the Lord's deeds, which I will perform for you. So what we're trying to do now is to make sense of um, not this passage as a whole, God, uh, gosh, uh, we would need much more time to, um, to explore the Torah portion as a whole. What I wanna do is a deep dive into, again, just the, the couple verses here that form uh, what our tradition calls the Yud Gimel Midot, the 13 attributes of mercy. So we turn to, the, to Rashi uh, as one uh, helpful key here. Rashi who lived was born just shy of a thousand years ago in 1040 um, uh, in France. And, uh, and one of the most prolific commentators, if not the most prolific commentator in all of rabbinic tradition, uh, produces a commentary in the entire Hebrew Bible and the, in, almost the entire Talmud, has this to say about, uh, about a few of the 
the parts, the phrases that we found in our, the passage we just read together. Um, and by the way, as a, as a, a style thing, uh, if, you're look, if you're following along closely on the sheet, you'll see how Safaria breaks down for the reader's aid, not just by providing a translation, but also noting chapter, verse, and then which of the comments in a, on a verse uh, you are looking at. So we'll begin with Rashi on Exodus 34, 6, the first comment. I skip the second one to the third and fourth, and then I'll go to the fourth comment on the next verse, verse 7. That's what you'll see on this page. So Hashem, Hashem, God, Lord, Lord, Rashi writes, this is midat rachamim. This is the attribute of divine mercy, divine compassion. Achat kodem shi'echate, the one, the first Hashem here, the first tetragrammaton alludes to God having mercy on the sinner before he sins, and the other after he has sinned and repented. And this is, um, he, uh, the translation here cites as does the, the edited version of Rashi here. Rashi himself did not actually tell you where, where he, was, he was editing, quoting from in rabbinic tradition. Um, the, the Talmud on uh, in Rosh Hashanah 17b, that is a wonderful um, uh, section on, of Agata, of legend and homily. I'm, we're not going to look at that passage today, but I highly recommend it, especially if you find slichot practice uh, meaningful. It will help you to understand a bit of how that lit liturgy arose. But let's, uh, that, let's continue with the next two uh, comments from this, this verse. Erech apayim, slow to anger. God defers his anger and does not hasten to punish. It may be that the sinner will repent. So we now see how um, focused Rashi is for what reason, what we don't yet know, why repentance is so key to an understanding of God's mercy. We might say, oh, is it just that God understands that the people were um, recently freed slaves? These are people who, who barely know what it means to live as a nation. Um, they, they've been through quite a bit together. So maybe it's just that God is, is merciful. No, there's actually more required of us and of the subject here. Uh, the, the, the Israelites who have sinned, to understand where Rashi is headed. Next comment, v'rav chesed, letzrichim chesed, ah, and God is abundant in mercy to those who need mercy because they have not sufficient merits to be saved by them. Okay, so now we're getting a little bit closer to um, this, the content of teshuva here. So teshuva, repentance, is something that one needs to do if something is, is, has, has transgressed, has, has gone astray, and doesn't have sufficient merits, ha hasn't built up a bank of sorts of good deeds that can outweigh their misdeeds. So that's one insight from a rabbinic tradition, not nearly enough to, go to, to carry us through this entire passage. How do we know that? Why? Because of this final, the final section on this page, and I'm going to pause right after this before we turn to the Mishnah and Gemara uh, in Masechet Yoma. Um, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll take some questions or comments in the chat before we, we move on to the other rabbinic material from that Rashi is uh, clearly working off of. So Rashi on uh, Exodus 34, 7, the fourth comment on that verse, v'nake lo yinake, and who will by no means clear the guilty? That's a a, one way of translating this, um, another way of translating it is something what we might call the adverbial absolute absolute or the absolute adverbial absolute, um, a very, a real mouthful in grammar. Um, this nake is the absolute form followed by uh, a perfect form of the verb, but in the negative. Um, so uh, absolvingly not absolve is one way that one might formally translate that, uh, but in a clunky sense. What does Rashi have to say? Lefip shuto. According to the plain sense of this verse, this phrase, this means that he is not altogether indulgent to sin. Meaning God will not simply say, ah, you know what? I, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Uh, no, God isn't so indulgent of our transgressions that God would simply give us the benefit of the doubt right off the bat, um, that God does not entirely remit 
punishment, but little by little, Rashi says, God exacts punishment from him, the sinner. Uh, again, pardon the, the gendered language here. Um, this is, of course, meant both for uh, B'nai Yisrael and Benot Yisrael. Our rabbis, however, have explained, and here Rashi is clearly citing from the Gemara that we're about to see. Vinake and he clears. Ah, he clears those who repent, the lo yinake. He does not clear does, those who will not repent. So God is setting the stage to allow us not only to recognize that we've gone astray, that, we've, that we've, we've committed some kind of transgression, that we have misdeeds, but that there is a path to correction. So I'm going to pause now. I'm going to stop the screen share for a second, uh, and let's, uh, let's check in together. Um, it, uh, so first question I see is Ra Rabbi saying Rashi. Uh, I am, um, I'm saying Rash, I'm, Ra, I am saying Rashi, which is Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, uh, a, an abbreviation of that um, longer um, full name. Uh, and uh, can I spell it here, please? Yes, I will. Uh, we are talking about Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki. This is one way that uh, his name would be transliterated. Um, given that he was barely even a Middle French speaker, um, although he does cite uh, Middle French often, Old French in his translations, uh, so that his audience will know if they're not um, thoroughly versed in Hebrew or Aramaic. Um, and great, so Freya, 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 uh, thank you for, for adding Wikipedia for what it's worth. Um, and Emma asks, so right, what is, what is Yoma? Let's, I will come back to that. Um, I will explain um, it, however much uh, Rosh Hashanah might seem obvious. It's not obvious what is in the, the, the tractate of Rosh Hashanah um, in the Talmud. Not, uh, neither is it um, clear what Yoma is always dealing with, uh, which is the Yom, the day, um, meaning Yom Kippur. Okay. Um, Rabbi Andy, there was um, a conversation about the phrase um, Kshe'oref, stiff-necked, yes. and what it means and where it comes from. I see from. that now, so coming from Betsy, um, and, uh, and then James responds. So stiff, um, yes, uh, Kshe'oref, uh, stiff-necked. So uh, here uh, you can see the agrarian roots of the Hebrew Bible, meaning that um, whether you believe that, that God wrote the Bible um, or that it is, has some human agency. It is clearly speaking to people who are coming out of an agrarian um, framework. It is written, uh, even the Talmud says this, Rabbi Yishmael very famously says, Torah dibra kilshon b'nei adam, that the Torah speaks in human language. So it's got to speak in language that we as humans would understand. So stiff-necked, um, there are so many um, uh, metaphors or euphemisms used uh, in the Torah and then in rabbinic parlance for um, uh, the way that oxes or cows or horses, uh, other um, uh, domesticated animals might be harnessed. So a stiff-necked animal is one who, um, who, who stiffen, that stiffens its neck in order to sort of resist the yoke of being um, harnessed, um, of, of being um, uh, Try, trying to, to, uh, to, to uh, humans trying to use it for domesticated purposes. Uh, let's put it that I, uh, it's been 20 odd years since I've been on a kibbutz and even then we, we didn't really use cattle in that way. Um, so um, I, I, forgive me for the, the clunkiness there. I, Randy, I see your hand, um, I, but uh, I, I think we're, we're, we're on mute now. So please use the chat uh, just so, so you know that I see you and uh, I see, Perhaps you're saying stiff-necked. Yes, so stubborn. Right, thank you. Um, going from the euphemism to the, uh, um, uh, what is intended by it. Uh, Michael asks, how does one become well-versed in Aramaic? That's, uh, well, if you can go to rabbinical school, my friend, um, or you can try to do doctoral work in, uh, in ancient Judaism or uh, ancient Semitic languages. Um, funny enough, you could also, um, simply immerse yourself in certain Mizrahi communities in Israel. 
Uh, I have, I have um, uh, met folks who are of Iraqi descent, um, who, uh, like folks who are of Sephardic descent who, who speak Ladino, or folks that we might know from Eastern European descent um, in, here in North America and also in Israel who speak Yiddish, there are still folks who preserve a version, um, uh, a dialect of Aramaic. There were actually many dialects of Aramaic. There are two different Talmuds, the Jerusalem Talmud, Yerushalmi, and the Babylonian, the Bavli. And we'll be looking at some Bavli right after this. Um, there are a lot of ways academic and so otherwise lived that one can begin to know Aramaic. Um, again, it, depends on what kind of Aramaic you want to know. What I don't suggest you do is go and see that Jim Caviezel movie, The Passion of the, 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 the not The Passion of the Christ. Um, yes, that's actually the wrong Aramaic. <laughs> that's Babylonian Aramaic, which is right for us, but that's not what Jesus would have spoken, friends. Uh, Jesus would have spoken a Judean Aramaic um, that was unique to uh, Roman-occupied Palestine, as they called it. They did not refer to it as Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. That was one of the ways that they subjugated the Jews um, uh, or those descended from Jews at that period. Okay. Um, yes, quite a few cl Christian clergy um, still learn Aramaic, uh, especially because the, the only extant ancient version of the New Testament is in Syriac. Um, after that, you get it, that's itself a translation, and you go from Syriac into the Latin, the Vulgate uh, translation of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Um, the Greek as well, these are talking about, your, it's, it's all Greek to me. It's, uh, those are all translation euphemisms, friends. Um, okay, nine new messages. I've, I've got a, Egyptian Coptic is a virgin, a type of Aramaic. I don't believe so. I, my, my knowledge of Coptic uh, is not uh, so great. Um, and uh, okay. So friends, I thank you for your responses. And um, let's move back to the text. Uh, um, if you have more responses, you can put them in the chat. And I believe Julie will be monitoring um, as my attention refocuses on, um, on the text sheet. So uh, with, with our slightly expanded class in mind, I'm going to, uh, our, our class time um, will go until 11.15 today. Um, I, nonetheless, I, uh, I'm running a little bit behind my own schedule. So I'm gonna focus on the Mishnah in Yoma and I'll explain wh wh what this is before we, we dive into the text itself. And then um, the, the key, couple key portions of the commentary, the Gemara that follow. So the Mishnah is the first stratus, uh, the first level of rabbinic commentary. Um, after the end of the, Bib the temple period, after the destruction of the second temple in 63 CE of our common era, so just shy of 2000 years ago, uh, the surviving rabbis in the land of Israel create this commentary that is largely legalistic, but not entirely. There are often some deep spiritual and homiletical, meaning um, uh, it, uh, comments from a more narrative-based perspective captured in this text. Um, and what's really fascinating is how many scholars today regard this not, at, not at, as one that was intended to be authoritative, but meant to be one that was pedagogical, that was meant to be memorized, and then by students who could memorize at least sections, if not the entirety of it, then lead to, much as we know from the, the, the Haggadah for Pesach, meant to be a conversation piece. So there were things that you needed to know, and there were a lot of things that are highly, highly um, uh, uh, esoteric here. You need to know a lot. And so the, the translation you will see that I will be reading from is an English translation of Steinsaltz, uh, the, the recently passed Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz, a tremendous figure from the last um, century who himself was raised secular and became religious in Israel and produced a Hebrew commentary on the entire Talmud, which is now translated, thank God, into English for uh, those of us who are lifelong learners. So the Mishnah in on Yoma 85b, um, this is the last chapter, uh, last of 10 chapters 
in the tractate dealing with Yom Kippur, but not only Yom Kippur. Of course, we are not only doing repentance on the day of Yom Kippur, and we learn a little bit more about that from this passage. The Mishnah states, a sin offering, which atones for unwitting performance of transgressions, punishable by karate, which means cutting off, but not, a, not just a physical cutting off from the people of Israel, but a spiritual and, and eternal cutting off. It's, it's quite scary. That's another uh, um, discussion for another time. Uh, punishable by karate and a definite guilt offering, which is brought for robbery and uses, misuse of consecrated items, very concrete um, misdeeds. A sin offering atones for those sins. Death and Yom Kippur atone for sins when accompanied by repentance. All right, so repentance, teshuva, is inherently an intrinsic part of our daily, weekly, yearly cycle of things, and something that appears once a year, Yom Kippur, and something that appears once in our lifetime, death, also have a role in uh, absolving us of our sins. What does that mean? Repentance itself, we go, going back to the text here, repentance itself atones for minor transgressions, for both positive mitzvot and negative mitzvot. Um, things that you're supposed to do and supposed that, things that you're supposed to not do. Uh, injunctions and prohibitions. And repentance places punishment for severe transgressions in abeyance until Yom Kippur comes and completely atones for the transgression. Meaning, if you observe Yom Kippur and you do it seriously and you're really praying, you're really fasting and praying, then the day somehow accomplishes a major part of the repentance, the teshuva uh, process. With regard, however, to one who says, I will sin and then I will repent, meaning I will intentionally go about sinning knowing that I'll just, I'll repent, I'll take care of it later. I will sin and I will repent. Oh, now this kind of behavior is, um, has become behavior. This has really become um, routine for a person. Ah, heaven does not provide him the opportunity to repent and he will remain a sinner all his days. Whether that's descriptive or prescriptive is um, for another discussion, however. With regard to one who says, I will sin and Yom Kippur will atone for my sins, ah, I, I'm just going to do what I'm going to do and hope that um, passively by, by fasting on Yom Kippur, that the day itself will atone for my sins? Nuh uh. Yom Kippur does not atone for that person's sins. Furthermore, for transgressions between a person and God, Yom Kippur atones. However, for transgressions between a person and another, Yom Kippur does not atone until he appeases the other person. You may have noticed how much of my own commentary I needed to add to the commentary translated into English from the Steinsaltz edition. That shows you just how esoteric the Mishnah can be and how much room then the rabbis who inherited the Mishnah as a text from their mentors their mentor teachers, the Tanaim, how much they had to work with. What you are about to see is how the, the, the Talmud, which is a, a combination of the Mishnah and the Gemara, the Gemara commentary, the Gemara now follows in chunks, or what we call sugyot, passages um, that focus on different issues that arise that require explication and um, clarification. So uh, I'm, I, look, in the interest of time, I'm just going to cite one, the, the last piece here, Yoma 85b13, you see on your screen, the last long sentence here uh, clarifies what, what is happening in this passage. One is not punished by a court, uh, a human court, for violating a prohibition for which the Torah prescribes a positive act as a corrective measure, and which thereby has the same halakha as a positive mitzvah. So, one of the problems here for the rabbis is understanding if somebody violates a negative commandment, you, you are prohibited from doing something and you do it anyway, well, the Torah has itself a corrective, not a rabbinic corrective, a biblical corrective, which is, ah, if you violated a certain prohibition in biblical law, often the prescription for that um, is to bring a sin offering. Great, you know what? As long as you bring that sin offering, that is a biblical form of teshuva. And by the way, it's not just bringing the sin offering. There was a whole repentance-like process uh, that when involved, was involved, not just bringing the animal and seeing it, it, it 
killed and it's blood splattered and then burned or whatever. Um, and, and the whatever is just to say there's a lot there that as a vegetarian, I don't want to discuss. <laughs> um, the whatever is very important. It is to say that passage uh, has that insight that um, don't worry, there, there, there's, there's already some element of what teshuva means here. We move on to the next passage, which brings us to that nake velo yinake um, language. Come and hear. This is, this is classic uh, editorial language uh, it, in the anonymous voice of the Talmud when it is about to quote an earlier source, most likely from the Tanaitic period, that first, that Mishnaic period. Um, so, Tashma, Lefishinem, Arbachorev, come and hear from a different source that was taught since it was stated at Horev, which is to say Mount Sinai with regard to repentance, quote, absolve, one might have thought that even the transgression of you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain is included among them. Therefore, the verse states will not absolve. We have another combination of absolve and not absolve from the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, verse 6. So one might have thought that this is also true for those who are liable for violating other prohibitions. Therefore, the verse states his name. God does not absolve the one who disrespects God's name, but absolves those who are liable for violating all other prohibitions and repent. This is proof that those who violate all other prohibitions are not comparable to one who violates. Ah, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. What's the difference here? We are now getting a distinction between violations, misdeeds, transgressions against God, spiritual transgressions, as it were, and human transgressions, transgressions against one's fellow person, another human being. Now the heart of the matter, friends. Yoma 86a, passage 5. Since the Gemara cited this Baraita, which is a, a snippet, um, not always coming from um, known extant rabbinic material, but material from that Mishnaic period, the Gemara, the Talmud, now clarifies part of it. The master, this is quoting uh, with um, a Tanaitic source, since it was stated at Horev with, with regard to repentance, right? This is the passage above. The Gemara now asks, from where do we derive this concept that repentance was mentioned there? The Gemara answers, as it was taught in a Brita, that Rabbi Elazar says, it is not possible to say absolve, again, uh, from Exodus, but now the passage that we'll be reading in, in, in synagogues tomorrow, Exodus 34, 7, about all transgressions, since will not absolve is already stated as well, for immediately following it in Exodus 34, 7. And it is not possible to say will not absolve, since absolve is already stated. How do we make sense of the, this combination, absolve, absolvingly not absolve? How so? Ah, so here is where Rabbi Elazar brings God into the equation. The Holy Blessed One absolves those who will repent and does not absolve those who do not repent, what Rashi sort of quotes in slightly different language. Therefore, both quote-unquote repentance and quote-unquote absolve were mentioned at Chorev. This is to say, this is as close as we get to a smoking gun for why the rabbis chop off lo yinake when we read the 13 attributes of, of mercy. What the rabbis say is totally radical. They're taking the core text of the Torah and say, don't worry about that lo yinake. That's, that's in the, the source text, but we believe that God actually absolves because God wants us to repent. And because God wants us to repent, God affords us this opportunity to turn even intentional sins into unwitting transgressions as Reish Lakish teaches in our final passage here. This is, to say, this is a part of a really radical sugya, a litany of teachings on the next, um, uh, in the next section of, of Talmud, um, it's the, not the next page, but the page after that, Yoma 86b. There is one teaching after another saying how great is repentance, how transformative, how radical is the notion of repentance. And Reish Lakish in that litany of teachings has this to say. Reish Lakish said, great is repentance as the penitence intentional sins. Even things like the Mishnah anticipated that were done in a routine way with full intent, with full knowledge. 
are counted for that person as though they were unwitting transgressions, totally accidents and mistakes. As it is said, return Israel to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled in your iniquity, quoting the, the prophet Hosea chapter 14 too. The Gemara analyzes this. Doesn't quote unquote iniquity mean an intentional sin? Ah, but the prophet calls it stumbling, implying that one who repents is considered as though one only stumbled accidentally into this transgression. So the Gemara asks another question. Is that really so? Didn't Ra Reish Lakish himself say, great is repentance as one's intentional sins are counted for him as merits? This is going even further. This isn't saying, oh, we're going to wipe the slate clean and turn these, these intended deeds into accidents. This is making them into positive things. Here's the growth mindset, folks. It is stated, and when the wicked turns from his or her wickedness, does that which is, and does that which is like lawful and right, he shall live thereby. Quoting a different prophet, Ezekiel, in 3319. And all his deeds, even his transgressions, will somehow become praiseworthy. So here's classic Gemara, even for a, an ethical teaching, to, to um, resolve the so-called um, uh, contradiction here between two different teachings of Reish Lakish. Is he radically suggesting that repentance is so great that even intentional sins can become like accidents? Or is it more than that, that they somehow become merits in our favor? The Gemara reconciles, this is not difficult. Here one repents out of love. So one's sins become like merits. And there one repents out of fear. One's sins are counted as, uh, as unwitting transgressions, as having been accidental. So here's where this can be totally transformative for us today, regardless of how you conceive of God, regardless of how you conceive of your observance as a Jew, as a seeker, what have you. Every human being has the capacity, according to our rabbinic sages, to grow all one's life. And according to Reish Lakish, it is all a matter of how much you love life and you love your commitment to your place in this world, as opposed to fearing um, the consequences of your misdeeds, that one, under, that one can understand um, how to grow from having gone astray. So friends, um, I cannot say enough about growth mindset as a school of thought in, uh, in pedagogy these days. This is not merely a theory. This is a big deal for, um, for learners at all levels. Um, and if this is the last time that we get to spend some time together uh, this year, 2021, um, or 5781, um, let me please leave you with this, that we have been through a heck of a year, haven't we? Uh, and two completely unprecedented Pesach experiences. Um, I, my heart goes out to my, my Christian cousins who will be uh, experiencing a second uh, very weird Easter. We might not have um, committed misdeeds to, to give rise to this pandemic, God forbid. But I'm sure there are ways in, in our um, approaching this totally unprecedented experience of the pandemic, of, of COVID life, have fallen short of the mark. According to Reish Lakish, it's okay. This is an opportunity for growth. It's not growth that we would have chosen. Uh, you don't have to be like me choosing to, to, to train again for a marathon at some point. Um, that's crazy. You, you don't have to be crazy like that in order to say, um, and to embrace the radical notion that whatever, however much you have, you have fallen short of the mark um, in a small way or maybe in a big way, maybe you know, out of frustration, you have spoken, you've been short with people. You may have used some, some words that were not the choicest words. You might not have, have had the most compassion and understanding for somebody else in what they were experiencing this past year. Doesn't matter as long as you, you, you come at 
those misdeeds, that, those falling short of the mark, those, not, let's not even call them transgressions, um, approach that with both love for the world that we are still privileged to live in, and maybe so a little bit, a, a tinge of fear that, um, that if we don't correct our course here, we're gonna continue to live short of our deepest and highest selves. Reish Lakish 2000 years ago would say to us today, you have the potential to be a better person. Harness whatever fear or love is in your heart for not, fear for not growing or love for what you hold most dear to become a better person. The, Maimonides who lived just shy of a thousand years ago says that there are three things that are core to the teshuva process. And with this, I'll end, friends. Um, and, and I hope that we can all sit with this, especially as we hear these verses read tomorrow morning. There are three steps that are crucial for, for true repentance. One is to feel remorse, to feel, to have a, a visceral reaction in reflecting upon ways in which we have fallen short, in which we have committed misdeeds, accidental or otherwise. Then to confess them. To be honest, at the very least with yourself, if not actually with the other person. And that means saying you're sorry and saying what it is in your own words, your own articulation, what it is that you did as a misdeed um, in falling short of the mark, if not full on transgression. And then the third part is to do some really hard work from this point forward on what it is that led you to. Um, to, to that action, to that moment. So that whenever you next face that opportunity to fall short of the mark, you don't. It's not saying that you're never going to make any mistakes again. It's to say, in, in, as, as the Rambam, Maimonides put it in, in his language, when facing that next opportunity to sin, to transgress, to, 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 to commit a misdeed, to fall short of the mark, you say, well, I would never do that. I'm not the same person I was in that moment whenever it was in my past. I am not the same person. That's not me. That person might have the same name as me, but that's some other iteration of myself. That's some deep Torah about, um, about growth mindset and about lifelong learning and what, as I believe God to be, God as the source of life requires of us. So friends, Shabbat Shalom, Modim Lasimcha, again, almost Chag Sameach as we approach this, this holiday weekend. Um, and if you have uh, uh, Christian and Muslim friends, um, reach out to them too. This is a holy time for them um, and they ha have got to be uh, facing some, some of their own soul pain for not being able to observe as, as they should be able to, as we all should be able to. And please God, soon after we all get vaccinated. Um, I'm off to get my second Pfizer shot. Please go get your shots and help others get their appointments. Uh, Julie, thank you for the opportunity to teach. Everyone, thank you. Uh, and um, stay healthy, stay safe.